This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Okay, what I'm going to do today is talk about some concepts that we've already heard about. First of all, a very brief review about kin selection. And then I'm going to go on to talk about the notion of suppression of competition or suppression of free riders within groups. And I'm going to do this in the context of the history of life. So we can really get a general idea about biology, about how cooperations evolve, just to set a context for studying humans. And so let's First of all, I'll do a very simple review of kin selection, just the basic principles, just as background. So when we see a mother lion or a mother elephant feeding their babies, we understand what's going on, right? The basic unit of success in biology is reproduction. And the basic unit of reproduction are parents providing resources for their offspring. But we know that in many cases, organisms do provide help to individuals that are not their direct offspring but they might help their siblings, brothers and sisters, cousins, and so on. So we know that bees and ants will raise their brothers and sisters rather than raising their own direct offspring. Randy mentioned that squirrels give alarm calls. An alarm call is a dangerous thing. It calls attention to the individual who gives the call. And that squirrels are known to do this primarily when they're around their sisters and half-sisters, and they won't do it when the individuals around are non-relatives. So that's another example of individuals taking on risk for themselves in order to help other individuals that are not their direct offspring, but are kin. Even in bacteria now, there's a huge amount of evidence that bacteria behave much more cooperatively when they're around close genetic kin. Though for, bacteria will, for example, secrete molecules that help to break down resources that other bacteria in the group can suck up. But when the degree of kinship among the bacteria is much lower, the bacteria don't do this as much, and they tend to compete much more with each other. So the degree of integration and cooperation among bacteria is strongly influenced by genetic relatedness. And this has actually turned out to be very important. And more and more, we're going to see this in biomedical research, understanding the role of kinship and infection. So this is a way going in the other direction from this symposium, my own interests tend to be looking at very simple organisms and how these ideas apply. And we tend to think of early human groups as being mostly small kin groups where individuals are cooperating with brothers and sisters and other kin. But we know that kinship's not enough in the history of life, even in simple biology, to understand the cooperation that we see in nature, because we see many examples in nature of individuals acting in ways that seem cooperative with other individuals that are not genetic kin at all. This is not just in humans, but throughout the history of life. So going back to humans for a second, though, as a puzzle, and this is to some extent what this symposium is about, we know that through the history of human, through human history, group sizes have gotten larger. Perhaps kinship was very important in small groups initially, but now we have large nation states and, and groups where clearly individuals have gone far beyond kinship. So what are the general principles that might span all the way up from through the history of life and on to humans? And the idea that I'm going to focus on, you can think of as constraints on competition within groups, things that tend to suppress the ability of individuals to compete with each other. So let's just imagine that we're in a group together and there's some resources and there's no rules at first or constraints. And so there's some resources and I could take those resources for myself from you and that might be a benefit to me. But at the same time, if I'm starting to take the resources from you, it might be a little harder for us to cooperate and act as a cohesive group if we needed to act cohesively. So what could then make us act more cohesively as a group? Prevent me from taking these resources, which are, at least in the short run, a benefit to me. And one thing that would be, in a very abstract sense, would be mechanisms that 
acted to suppress internal competition within groups. If there was some mechanism so I wasn't allowed to or was prevented in taking things from you so that there was a fair distribution of resources in the group, then the only way that I can improve my own success, I can't compete with you because there are rules, the only way I can increase my own success is by acting cooperatively with you to increase the efficiency of our group, perhaps in competition against other groups. So it's an extremely simple idea, but the power is tremendous. If there are mechanisms that suppress competition, individuals can only improve their own success by acting cohesively and cooperatively within, the, within a group. Now, I want to talk about that idea and develop it through the sort of, first of all, give you a little background from what is roughly speaking moral philosophy in humans. And then we'll go back and talk about that through the history of biology so we can see the structure of the concept. So I think that perhaps the first person who's often credited with this idea of sort of suppression of competition, it's hard to say who first said it, but the person who now gets cited the most is Adam Smith. Now you know the name Adam Smith from The Wealth of Nations, of course a very famous book thought to be the first discussion of free markets and competition, capitalism, and also ascribed to Adam Smith is the notion that free markets are very efficient for groups, right? If you simply leave individuals to pursue their own selfish interests, the invisible hand and out emerges beautiful cooperative markets where everybody's better off. Now Adam Smith knew that that was nonsense, okay? But nonetheless, everybody quotes Adam Smith as having said it. But Adam Smith didn't believe that or certainly wrote against it. In fact, Adam Smith wrote a second book, which is also not as famous, but is quite well known, and it was called Moral Sentiments. And I want to give you not a quote from Adam Smith, I'll tell you about that in a second, but from Egbert Lee, who was writing about Adam Smith. And what Egbert Lee said was, Adam Smith argued that if individuals had sufficient common interest in their group's good, they would combine to suppress activities of members acting contrary to the group's welfare. Okay, so individuals in a human group, if they can see that there are problems, they can band together to suppress that internal competition, and that's going to promote the group welfare, which is the idea I've been discussing with you. Now, if you read what Adam Smith said, he wrote in the 18th century, and the language is a little different. It's not exactly clear. It looks like that's what he meant. I think that's a reasonable interpretation. But turning to more modern studies, again, sort of in what we might call moral philosophy, there's a very famous idea, which is now widely known, called the Veil of Ignorance. You may have heard of this. It was published in a book by John Rawls in 1971. And what Rawls was wondering about is, how can we form a just and fair society? What are the ways in which we might do that? And what Rawls said is, okay, this is what we're gonna do to form a just and fair society. We're gonna get together as a group, and we're gonna make the rules for our group, the moral laws, the legal system and so on. And we're gonna make those rules as they apply to rich people or poor people, to powerful people or to people who are weak and subordinate. And we're gonna make all those rules and laws to govern all the interactions from behind a veil of ignorance about our own position in society. And then, right? And then we're gonna be randomly assigned to a position. So we don't know if we're gonna be rich, we don't know if we're gonna be strong, but we might also be weak or poor. But before that, we're going to agree that the rules are fair before we know where we go, behind a veil of ignorance. So these are quotes from Rawls. A just society establishes rules that individuals regard as fair from behind a veil of ignorance about their position within society. An individual may in practice end up on one end or the other of any particular social interaction. That is to say, you're gonna be assigned randomly to a position. So you better think that the overall structure is okay. Now this notion of randomization is extremely powerful in terms of creating fairness. But so far I've been talking to you about human moral philosophy, but I started out by telling you that I was gonna tell you about the history of life. So how does this idea of randomization apply throughout the history of life? And in fact, it applies extremely well and very importantly throughout the history of biology. There's a phenomenon in biology that's called fair meiosis. And biologists actually use that word fair meiosis. Now what is that? Well, you probably know that when you were born you got some genes from your mother and some genes from your father. And basically for every gene that you have, for the most part, you've got one from your mother and one from your father. And these genes are on chromosomes, so they're packaged that way. So you have lots of chromosomes and they're paired up. Mother's chromosome, father's chromosome, mother's chromosome, father's chromosome. So that's what your genes are like. 
And when you go to make a baby, sperm or egg, we call sperm or egg a gamete. So you make a gamete. And when you make a gamete, do you pass your mother's gene or your father's gene through the gamete? Because the gamete only contains half of your genes because you're going to mate with somebody and the other half's going to come from your mates. So you're going to make a baby with two copies. So do you pass your mother's or your father's? And the answer is it's random, right? There's a 50-50 chance for the most part for each of your genes that'll be your mother's or your father's gene. So we say each gamete has an equal or random chance of transmitting the maternal or paternal copy. Randomization puts each chromosome behind a veil of ignorance. We want to say it that way. Biologists usually don't say it that way. But it's a reasonable point because the only way that a chromosome can increase its own contribution, the number of copies of a chromosome to the future, is to increase the total number of babies that you make because each chromosome has a random chance of making it into each baby. So chromosomes can only increase their own reproduction by increasing the total number of babies you produce. Now, if chromosomes, if one chromosome, your father, say, or your, let's say your mother's, could outcompete your father's chromosome and get into more babies, that chromosome would increase in frequency because all that matters is outcompeting and making more copies. And that would mean that your chromosomes could compete and you really wouldn't be an individual anymore so much because there would be competition within you over reproduction. And that may sound weird, but it happens throughout genetics. We call that meiotic drive, where there's competition between chromosomes. So the very notion of you as an individual, which you accept so fully and completely, is actually completely dependent through the history of life on this notion of randomization and fairness. That's what makes you into an individual. Because it joins together all of your chromosomes into a common interest. The only way each gene and chromosome can increase its success historically is by increasing the success of you as an individual. So chromosomes, we said that, chromosomes can increase their own success, right? So, so Egbert Lee, he's a very flowerly language, it's always fun to quote him. The many genes of the genome repressed drive, that's competition between chromosomes. Repressed drive is if we had to do with a parliament of genes which so regulated itself as to prevent cobbles of a few conspiring for their own selfish profit at the expense of the commonwealth. Okay, that's very flowery. But it's actually not very far off because we know that fair meiosis doesn't just happen if you're a biologist. There's never integration and cooperation without something behind it. Fair my and in fact, in your genome and in the genomes of all organs that have this process are a lot of mechanisms that suppress internal competition. We know that because we see it break down and we see the unity of the genome breaking down in some cases. So for the most part, the unity of the genome that makes you an individual holds, but it doesn't just start that way. That emerged from the history of life, and it wasn't the default ancestral condition. So if you ever got taught genetics, you get taught Mendelian genetics as if that was God created Mendelian genetics, and that's how it works. But that isn't what happened in the history of life. Something happened to cause integration. So fair meiosis is one example, a second example which is just a simple one to describe because it's a simple experiment, was done by Jessica Flack on pigtailed macaques. We're talking about suppression of competition in general. And this is a simple experiment. Here's a little enclosure of macaques, and these are M's or males. And the males act to suppress competition in the group. They break up fights, and they kind of keep the peace, and they keep things under control. And Jessica was interested in, well, how much do these males really help in integrating the society? How, how could she tell? So she did what all biologists do when they want to understand something, which is that they take it away or they knock it out. So she did what she called the behavioral knockout experiment. She took the males and she stuck them outside so they couldn't get into the group. And what happened? Well, all hell broke loose. These, they started fighting a lot more and there was a real breakdown in social integration. And so her own, using her own language, she said, we observed that when policing, they call these males policing because they break up things and kind of keep the order. We observe that when policing is operational, group members build larger social networks characterized by greater partner diversity and increased potential for socially positive contagion and cooperation. Without policing, high conflict frequency and severity leads to more conservative social interactions and a less integrated society. So that's a fancy way of saying all hell broke loose. But that's basically, if you read the paper, that's what happened. There was really a real breakdown in social order. A lot of the standard cooperative behaviors, grooming, affiliate behaviors of primates, really decreased tremendously without that imposition. And these males were, were not just breaking up fights with kin. They were sort of acting really in the group as an overall structural organizers. 
So we've heard about Richard Alexander. Richard Alexander was a biologist. He studied crickets, actually. It was his main life's work. But he became interested in humans, and he's often quoted in these studies about human sociality because he was looking over the history of life and really trying to understand from the history of life and what we know about cooperation in the history of life, how we could understand what happened in human evolutionary history, this transition in particular from small groups as group sizes got larger and larger throughout human history and how we could understand the transcendence of, of kin groups. And Alexander said, the function of laws is to regulate the reproductive and I think selfish striving of individuals and subgroups within societies in the interest of preserving unity in the larger group. Presumably unity in the larger group feeds back beneficial effects to those that propose, maintain, adjust, and enforce the laws. But really what he's saying is, and he was very interested in roles. He was saying really that laws and, and moral strictures in some sense act to help with group integration. And he was particularly interested in group against group competition. And so in this sense, the integration of groups really depended on this internal suppression of competition through laws and moral strictures and these sorts of things. And so this was his view of human evolutionary history or human history in any case. Now going back to the history of life, John Maynard Smith was thinking about the span of the history of life and cooperation, as I sort of indicated briefly today. And Maynard Smith had this very nice 1988. He said, one can recognize in the evolution of life several revolutions in the way in which genetic information is organized. Again, my point is we didn't start out with these complex genomes with meiosis, that something that evolved. In each of these revolutions, there has been conflict between selection at several levels, genes and genomes, individuals and groups, and so on. The achievement of individuality at the higher level or cohesiveness of a group at a higher level has required that the disruptive effects of selection at the lower level be suppressed. And so, to me, the two great principles in the history of life of cooperation are kin selection, which gets talked about a lot. This notion of suppression of competition internally, it gets mentioned, people sort of understand it. We had one person mention it quite prominently. But the degree to which it's integrated into the very basis of everything we know about the history of life, I think is not as widely appreciated as it should be. To me, kin selection and suppression of competition are the two great forces in the history of life. Now, reciprocity and reciprocal altruism and game theory ideas, okay, that's great for fish and humans, but most of the history of life isn't with fish and humans and brains, right? It's with very simple organisms. And we see these principles through, then really organizing throughout the history of life. And I think that it's helpful to have that span and perspective when talking about humans. It doesn't answer any particular problem about humans, but certainly if you ever want to read Alexander, you have to understand that background, that he's really coming from this perspective. And so I think that's, um, since I don't study humans and I was asked to speak today, I think that's what I could bring to you is something about that biological perspective, just to give you a little background and context. So thank you very much.